And now the judges will introduce themselves. All right. Good afternoon, West Virginia. My name is Petra Al Sufi, and I am the Outreach and Partnerships Manager at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. We're a research organization that research American Muslims and other faith communities. I'm also on the board of the Michigan Center for Civic Education. And many years ago, I was in your place as a student participant in We the People program. So this is me from the future telling you you'll survive this. <laughs> um, enjoy the moment and the presentation, and I hope it can inspires you to continue um, public service in um, civic education. Uh, good afternoon, West Virginia. My name is Dan Wong. I am a retired attorney and former judge. I'm on the National Board of Directors for the Center for Civic Education. I live in Boise, Idaho. I'm excited to listen to your testimony and presentation today. Good afternoon, everyone from West Virginia. I am from East Virginia, AKA Virginia. Um, I am a state government policy professional. So I'm currently a policy advisor for the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services. Prior to that, I did nonpartisan policy analysis and I evaluated the performance of government programs for the Virginia General Assembly. And those types of jobs are available in every state and every state legislature. And that's part of why I do this, to make sure you young people know that. Um, this is my third year of being involved with We the People, and I'm very excited to hear your presentation and to get to talk with you. All right, students, please go ahead and introduce yourself and introduce your teacher. I'm Aiden Taylor, a junior at Clay County High School. I'm Cheston Haynes, and I'm a senior at Clay County High School. Very nice to meet you all. My name is Jaden Coger. I'm also a senior, and we're joined by a teacher, Mr. Phil Dobbins, and our coach, Mr. Mike Mullins. All right, good to have you all here. So I'm going to go ahead and read the question for you, and then you'll have four minutes for your statement. President Dwight Eisenhower said, we must guard against the acquisition of, unwanted, of unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of, of misplaced power exists and will persist. Do you agree or disagree and why? In what disagreement did the founders have about a standing army and are they relevant today? And to what extent should there be um, an international US military presence? The panel agrees that the United States should not support the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned us about in his farewell speech. The military industrial complex or MIC is an informal alliance between a nation's military and the defense industry that supplies it seen together as a vested interest which influences public policy. Along with Eisenhower, we agree that the MIC can promote policies that might not be in the country's best interest, such as participation in the nuclear arms race. Military forces have been funded overwhelmingly by national governments, which historically has been the target of lobbying efforts by bureaucrats and military-related ministries, by legislatures from districts containing military bases or major military manufacturing plants, and by representatives of public and private firms involved in the production of weapons and munitions. Because the goal and interests of these various actors broadly coincide, they tend to support each other's activities and to form mutually beneficial relationships. What some critics have called an iron triangle between government officials, legislatures, and military industrial firms. For example, legislators who receive campaign contributions from military firms may vote to award funding to projects in which the firms are involved and military firms may hire former defense ministry officials as lobbyists. The United States debt is atrocious. We are $28 trillion in debt. Many argue today that military spending is too much. A politician getting votes from military firms in return for funding or military projects undermines and completely disregards democracy. By representing corporations rather than the people, the politician is acting corrupt, which leads to a dysfunctional government. Just as President Eisenhower feared the potential for abused power in a military industrial complex, the founding fathers feared the same with standing armies due to their long history of tyrannical oppression. James Madison states this notion in a speech given shortly before the Constitutional Convention, saying constant apprehension of war has the same tendency to render the head too large for the body. A standing military force with an overgrown executive will not long be safe companions to liberty. In addition to the fear of uh, usurpation of power and destruction of liberty, Federalists and Anti-Federalists are born to standing militia due to the morals and composures of soldiers. 
Armies were typically composed of lower class citizens, many of which had corrupting influence on others. Creating a standing army would allow them to exert their influence on society and corrupt it from within. Today, however, the army produces intelligent and well-disciplined people who are responsible for keeping our nation and our citizens safe. Some of the founders fear of a standing militia are completely relevant today, specifically the potential for abuse of power in the art of war. A treatise published by Nicole Machiavelli, he states that the reason for this tyrannical nature in a military occurs when a, quote, soldier makes war his only occupation. Although there are checks on the executive branch that lessen the chances of military industrial conflict, the possibility for tyrannical military rule is always present. Instances where the implementation of a national military can be defined as places where a credible threat to national security persists, an attack on allies is possible, or the aid of foreign policy, such as through assistance with military troops. The United States has one of the largest military presences um, overseas in any other nation. With this, it is accurate to assume that we are allocating billions of dollars overseas for an unclearly defined mission. Furthermore, it can be very costly, ineffective, and detrimental to the lives of Americans to keep troops at international bases. One other major effect of keeping forces in other places across the globe besides the United States is that we're doing one of two things adding more money to our military budget that could be allocated to other domestic programs, or we are taking troops away from bases in the United States that could provide greater protection to its citizens. In all the extent for which a large international military presence is of the utmost importance is non-existent. All right, thank you. So um, a follow-up question is um, about your last point, which is the military spending, spending in military budget. Um, do you believe um, that the military budget should be controlled, reduced? Um, why or why not? And if, if we do reduce it to what, uh, what domestic um, causes should we re reallocate that funding? It's a great question. And I definitely personally and um, a majority of our panel agrees that rather than us just going and cutting funding um, and having to pick exactly, this is where we're taking military funding from. We should go through our budget um, for the military and find where we can make it more effective and efficient. So looking at ways that we can um, modify the means of production and the ways that this money is being allocated to be more effective so that we can ensure that tax dollars are being spent properly and that we're defending our country properly. Now, that's to say, if we allocate our budget differently and make sure that it's efficient and effective, we're going to have extra money that's in the spare that we do agree that should be allocated to other domestic um, programs. Some of those could be um, the inclusion of post-secondary education, um, including uh, um, more allocated money to social welfare programs or uh, increasing the amount of diversity in um, our country and inclusion, whether that be with um, local, state, or federal agencies. And of course, if we're going to um, control or reduce this military budget, we would obviously have to look at places where we need to um, pull back from. And I feel like we stated in our response that a good example of this is the United States has a very prominent military presence overseas. Um, you know, we have military bases near China and North Korea, and these can breed you know, sort of um, hostility and it can breed tension. So I feel like a good place to withdraw would maybe to take some of these um, military bases overseas out. I agree with my teammates. I would, there is a quote, but I forgot exactly what it says, but essentially it says um, the best way to have peace is be prepared for war. <clears throat> so this question is for all of you. If we remove our bases from China, near China and North Korea, how are we going to quickly and efficiently address the threats that they pose? For example, China, you know, building their artificial islands in the international waters of China seas, uh, North Korea threatening Seoul, Korea with their nuclear weapons. If we take those bases out, how are we going to quickly and efficiently respond to aggression, their aggression? That's a great question. Um, and I know that Jaden has a really good response to this too, but we can also look um, and all agree that as we move further into the future, that our methods of war have changed. Um, wars become more technological um, and biological rather than those boots on the ground, hand in hand fighting. Um, and we can all agree on that. So that means that our military also needs to mold and conform to those new constraints of war. 
Um, and one of those is the addition of President Trump's Space Force. Uh, we see a lot of the times with China and Russia and most of these other countries in the Middle East that they're um, not as much fighting aggressively hand in hand, but more these technological aspects that they're uh, forcing and using as a threat to our infrastructure and our citizens in the United States. So I agree that we definitely need to make sure that we can respond quickly and efficiently and be effective in our means. But I think that we can start to do that from afar and remotely, just like we're holding this meeting, uh, rather than actually having to be there in person. I would Absolutely. just like to add Go ahead, to Jason's response. Um, a lot of the battles and wars fought in today's time is cyber warfare. Yeah, and to add to that, I feel like, um, you know, if we are going to remove some of these military bases, um, we should place the ones that we do have very strategically. Um, so that way, you know, we could make sure that we could get to the, the areas that we need to access readily. Um, we could get to those areas in a, as a short amount of time as possible. So placing those area, those bases strategically um, throughout the world be a great advantage. So I, <clears throat> I would like to bring the conversation back domestically a little bit. We focused a lot on what you all said about the international presence of the military. Um, thinking about the possibility for corruption of public officials' decisions because of campaign contributions, for example, <laughs> excuse me, that's my dog. Um, how, you know, how specifically would you address this? And then could you anchor your solutions in other principles from the constitution or that are reflected in our government so that I can feel confident that those solutions are likely to succeed? So I think the first thing, especially with some domestic issues is our government is through this iron triangle that we mentioned, um, providing, our country with a means of lining the pockets of these companies. Um, if you look, there are probably three or four companies that control most of our military uh, spending and all of the means that we have. So um, General Dynamics, uh, uh, and then you have Boeing that's providing aircrafts and things like that. And if you look, if our government is continuing to sponsor these uh, companies, they're also providing lobbyists through a revolving door. Um, and you know, this is, you could say is a monopoly, which is illegal in the constitution and something that capitalism is built to steer away from and avoid. So I think that the first step that we would need to take is looking at um, some other countries, how they've done it and also making modifications that our um, government could think up ideas on how to eliminate this military industrial complex or iron triangle as it's called. Absolutely, and to add on to that, you know, I feel like it's important to look at how much um, these companies are generating um, as far as military spending. So we have Lockheed Martin, um, which last year generated $56 billion in revenue, 95% um, of which was um, defense revenue. So as Aiden stated, you know, looking at the manner in, what, in which other countries um, structure their military spending and uh, such as France, the government actually you know, manuf manufactures their own weaponry um, for the military, um, which, you know, eliminates uh, these big companies that have the ability to exert their influence. To compare and contrast with my teammates, um, for example, Lockheed Martin alone um, has an employee base of over 200,000 200, jobs it creates, and it is great. It creates a lot of jobs, essentially. It's good for the economy. All right, so um, I'm gonna switch this a little bit and um, ask your opinion about um, the, the military equipment um, being used by the police force um, and military trainings being, uh, or the police force being trained uh, using military technique. Um, is that in itself a danger or a threat to our civil liberties and to American democracy? Or do you think that's an okay thing to do? Why or why not? I'm actually glad that you asked. Um, Vox, a common news company, has a lot of great information about this and um, the military providing all of these supplies at a discounted cost, if not free, to our local police forces. And as we see in the Constitution and the United States Code, it's illegal for um, our 
troops to be used against our people unless it's a time of martial law. So it's definitely agreeable that there's something going on here um, and it is not right for us to be using um, these military type supplies. Thank to- you, that is time. Hey, excellent work. Um, so that was really good. Um, I really liked uh, your participation, um, your, your, your open statement, uh, definitely strong, and you used, um, you know, you backed it with evidence. Um, and then your follow-up questions, um, you seem to have a very wide range of um, areas that you touched on. We were trying to, you know, let's, let's throw a different uh, question, let's bring a different topic. And you're like, oh, I'm glad you asked about that. Um, so clearly prepared, um, you all built off of each other's um, statements and comments. Um, so we didn't hear a lot of uh, repetition. Um, and then when you disagreed or you presented a different view, which is always um, encouraged, you, you, you did it respectfully and, um, and again, supported your, supported your opinion. So great work. I thought you guys were, uh, were pretty good. So I enjoyed your presentation. Um, I, this is one of those situations where I will tell you that I have a love-hate relationship with uh, We the People because I love listening to you, but I hate it when time is up because uh, when you, as you have done in this case, uh, cause me to ask or want to ask a lot of questions, I hate it when they say it's time. Um, and in that vein, I, I mean, I did enjoy your presentation. You said uh, some very interesting things that I wanted to follow up on. Um, we only got the uh, three and a half questions. And so uh, I, I think my feedback for improvement would be in answering our cross-examination questions, if you would be more direct and concise uh, answering. And uh, I mean, I loved listening to your answers because they were very thought-provoking and intriguing, but when you go on and on, unfortunately, we don't get to ask as many questions. And um, the more questions we're able to ask you, the more you're able to display your knowledge and allow you to, you know, cite historical examples, contemporary examples, uh, do quotes, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So that would be my one uh, feedback for improvement, but a good performance. And I enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that my fellow judges have said. Um, you know, you all worked really well as a team. So sometimes, um, especially getting to this level, um, you know, members of a team can almost seem like they're competing with one another, right? Like trying to make sure that that their examples are like more impressive than the next person, or at least it can come across that way sometimes. And I did not get that sense from you all at all. You know, like my colleague said, it was clear that you all were really supporting one another, that you were doing this team effort that you were each individually contributing to in some way. Um, a point of feedback, um, you know, Cheston, I really liked that you um, kind of would, would weigh in as with the contrary view a lot of the time, but you would only say that, you know, the opposing view and then you didn't really go into you know, why that matters or where that disagreement comes from or what have you. And I encourage you, you know, expound on your ideas, just like your teammates do. Um, that makes for a richer conversation and discussion in general. Um, you all should be really proud of yourselves. You know, this, the past 15 months have been just so hard for so many people. And um, I'm proud of you and all of your fellow students competing today. Just keep up the good work. Thank you.